Alex. Good morning. We're going to go on the record now. We're here for the third day hearing of this interest arbitration. Um, just to point out, uh, Jim Sullivan will be sitting uh, on the panel today and tomorrow in place of Fred D'Angelo, and we're joined by David Hackett um, from Buchanan Ingersoll for the uh, management team for the Commonwealth. Um, it's still the union's production right now, so whenever you want to get started. Go ahead. Thank you. I want to just welcome everybody to day three of the PSCOA's case in chief. I think the mics are a little stronger today than last week. I hope everybody can hear us. Um, at this point, we're going to call uh, our first witness, which is Robert Storm. Morning, sir. Morning. Very good. Uh, Officer Storm has testified previously and it described uh, his history with the DLC. Uh, this morning, Officer Storm is going to talk about uh, the vest that we've heard a lot about so far. Uh, we're going to get a little bit more specific today. Um, we've brought out uh, the actual vest, as you can see on the mannequin. Um, but let me ask you this, Bob. Let's go through the slides first, um, and let's talk about the particular vest that the H1 members are mandated to wear. Uh, the particular vest is an Armor Express Taurus Spike 2. Is that correct? Yes, sir. OK. And when it designates the thinness, what does that reference? That would be the thickness of the vest. OK. Sure, if you can take the mic right now and we can talk about the vest, I think it'll be easier that way. I'm actually a little disappointed. I thought you were going to have vests for each of us to wear all through the proceedings. Today. We thought about that. <laughs> well, you know what, Mr. Arbitrator? I was actually wanted to do a test with somebody on a computer to wear it for eight hours in a day and see how it feels if we could do that. <laughs> I think Brian will, will volunteer Brian. for that one. <laughs> I'll put it on. <laughs> okay. So, in the weight, what does the weight designate? The weight is the actual weight of the vest. It's 0.48 pounds per foot. So, okay. essentially, you know, if you want to measure it up per foot, you're looking at maybe four foot of vest. So, four to five pounds. And, and in your experience wearing the vest, uh, we've heard issues about uh, heat and things of that nature. Um, what, what, in your experience, has, does the weight of the vest affect you throughout the day? Oh, yeah, most definitely. Uh, I can take you through a little scenario. Um, come to work 6 to 2 in the morning, you're an RHU officer. RHU officers have to actually uh, feed the inmates, lug the trays upstairs. Um, by the time they finish, feeding the inmates takes about a half hour, you're already soaked. And for the rest of that day, for that eight hour day, you're soaked and there's nothing you can do about it. Right. Now, the vest that we have there right now is on the outside of the uniform, but describe, and we have that so you can see it better, but describe how it's supposed to be worn on a regular shift. The actual vest is worn on the inside of the uniform shirt over a t-shirt is over the vest. Okay. And I see on the back of it there's 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 a tail and then on the front I think it's tucked in but is there some type of uh, part that hangs down in the front? Yeah, there's actually a tail in the front too. Okay. Tucked and what's the purpose of the the two parts that hang down? Actually just to hold it closer to your body to you know try to keep the vest from moving at all. Does the vest have uh, the propensity to ride up on you throughout the day? Yes, it does. Okay. Um, if you want to have a, well, let me ask you the final thing. The vest now on this mannequin, is it on properly? Is it too high? Is it too low in, in your experience? It, it actually is a little bit low right now. I find it would ride up higher on the shoulders. It actually, it'll fit a little better on the shoulders 
you know, it's going to actually probably ride up about another inch on most of us that wear them. Okay. And the exposure that we see on the neck area and the arm area, is that typical? Yeah, that's typical exposure. Okay. Kidney area in the bottom, stomach okay. area down in here. All right. Um, if you can have a seat, let's talk about um, the numbers that we have on the slide here. Um, we have a cost per unit of 309 and 329 dollars it says depending on carriers where, where did those figures come from and, and why are there two sets of figures uh, the figures were actually uh the doc had a quote into armor express and that's where we uh retain those figures right now okay the difference in the cost is the difference in the carrier the 309 is a standard carrier the 329 is a carrier that basically would be worn by maintenance. Uh, what happened was one of our maintenance guys, Art Welder, caught his vest on fire. So they took it to the Uniform Committee and the Uniform Committee basically uh, determined on a fire resistant carrier for maintenance. Okay, so the 309 figure is a regular carrier, the 329 is a fire retardant carrier, is that correct? Yes. Okay, if we can go to the next slide, please. Now we've we've calculated, or at least we've gotten some some more figures on the actual total cost of replacement. Um, and, and what are we looking at here? Uh, we're looking at for nine thousand four hundred vest would be two million nine hundred four thousand dollars, or nine hundred two million nine hundred four sixty. Okay. And then we have the six. The six hundred figure is for the fire retardant, um, and we have about one hundred ninety-seven thousand there. All right. So a total cost of replacement, at least at this particular time, the quote that we received from, or the Commonwealth received from Armor Express, is three point one million dollars. Is that correct? Yes. All right. You can do the next slide, please. Now, just to just to sort of refresh everybody's recollection. Um, and I think it, it became apparent during day one and two of these hearings that this vest issue um, is a issue that's important, one of the core issues to the membership. In the survey, there were some questions related to the vest, were there not? Yes. Okay, and the first question in the survey um, talks about um, in the past five years, have you been involved in a physical confrontation? And what were the, what were the, refresh our recollection as to the results of that, that question? 51% of the membership that was, or 51% said yes, they were involved in a con physical confrontation, and 49%. Okay. And, and, and there was some, there was a little back and forth about how you would define, or how an officer would define physical confrontation. Uh, in your mind, is it pretty? Is that? Is there any confusion as to what that question meant? No. What do, What do you think it means? Any physical confrontation. You know, I mean, basically, if you touch me or any type of actual, yeah, any hands on. And this this isn't ballroom dancing. This is no. okay. I mean, we're talking about some nasty confrontations. Okay. I mean, basically assaults. All right. If we can go to the next slide, please. The, one of the other questions was um, the next question, and what was the next question I'm, what was the next question posed? It's. You wear those glasses, Tom. I think I think my glasses. In any assault, did the wearing of the protective vest provide you protection, okay? And the results of that were pretty staggering, were they not? 80% said no. Okay. And now again, and I think this was more where there was a issue of what the term assault means. Um, was there any confusion in at least your mind what the term assault means? No. And what, what would you define assault to mean? A physical confrontation. Okay. Now, the, the last question related to the vest, just to refresh everybody's recollection, was um, should the wearing of the pr protective vest be optional? 
And there was a pretty strong showing from the membership in that regard, was there not? Yes, there was, 93%, as you can see. Okay. Excuse me, um, Bob. With respect to the, the question, you know, obviously these people, I, I think a corrections officer knows when he's been assaulted or not. Um, I, I would hope, at least. Um, it's not like lawyers that go to law school and learn that assault has a specific legal meaning. But to the average person, do you have any idea why people think that, or people have reported that the vest doesn't help? Basically, I, I think because the target area has changed with them wearing the vest. You know, what do you mean by that? Uh, you no longer, the inmate knows you're wearing the vest, okay? So he's not going to go after that area, you know, from your chest down. He's going to go after your head. And, you know, basically, you know, we're going to have testimony to show that. You know, there's no documentation to where the vest has actually helped anybody in any kind of assault. Okay. Now, we saw earlier that the H1 membership is mandated to wear the vest, but let's talk about specifically who. Um, obviously, CO1, CO2 are mandated to wear the vest, correct? Yes. And the food service instructors are mandated to wear the vest? Yes and the maintenance and the trade instructors are mandated to wear the vest, correct? Yes. There's some people that have direct contact, though, with inmates that do not wear the vest. Is that correct? Yes. And, and give us some examples of, of those individuals. Unit managers, which are on the housing units all day long. Counselors are on the housing units all day long. Uh, teachers, which are in the school building, have classes going on. But inmates in them all day long, okay. secretaries that are on the housing unit. And what about the uh, forensic security employees? They do not wear them. All right. And then the CCC monitors? They do not wear them. Now, the individuals that you just described, they have direct contact with inmates on a regular basis, on a lengthy ba daily basis? Yes, they do. Has the DOC, to your knowledge, ever enunciated why these individuals don't have to wear the vest? No, not to my knowledge. Okay. Now, in your particular, in your personal opinion, do you like wearing the vest? No. Why not? It's hot. It's uncomfortable. Uh, it just to me serves no purpose. You go into work eight hours a day, 16 hours a day. You know, it's hard enough when you're dealing with inmates on a daily basis. And now you have this vest that just weighs you down. Very okay. Now, you, I don't know if you described this in your previous testimony, but um, you're the Eastern Vice President for PSCOA, correct? Yes. Um, and how long have you been the Eastern Vice President of PSCOA? Well, it's been about eight months right now. Okay. And previous to that position, did you hold any other position, positions with PSCOA? I did. And what were those? I was uh, local vice president for approximately six years and local president for approximately a year. And I served on the state e board for approximately a year and a half. Okay, so we're talking a, close to 10 years working on the state level or local level with PSCOA? Yes. And just briefly describe every SCI has a local union? They do, all 27. Uh, and it, each local union has president, vice president, et cetera? Yes. All right. And where were you the local vice president and local president? Excuse me, where are they? What, what location were you a local vice president, local president? SCI Monthly. Okay. Now, some of your duties and responsibilities, obviously, as a union official, is to listen to the concerns, listen to the problems of the membership. Is that correct? Yes. All right. In your capacity as a PSCOA official, have you received feedback regarding the vest? I have. And what type of feedback have you received? Uh, it's all negative. Nobody wants to wear the vest. I, you know, I've taken phone calls, tours of the jails, and the basic consensus is nobody wants to wear them. Okay. 